I had no idea that the word females is now a dirty word. You see from my I just wanted girls to like me video from a few weeks ago, I got so many comments that I didn't really fully understand. First of all, so many comments just had the word simp, and I didn't understand what that meant, so I actually had to go look that up. But apparently, it's a slang insult for men who are seen as too attentive or submissive to women, basically somebody who will do anything to get a woman's attention. And I guess that is true because as I shared in that video, I did go through the phase of wanting to reinvent myself because I wanted girls to notice me and like me. Starting with my hair and my clothes and that silly green with envy shirt that a lot of you actually said you thought was cool, which I really appreciate. But along with the simp comments, I also got a lot of comments calling out my use of the word females when referring to the girls at my school that I was trying to get the attention of. I didn't understand and I even had one user explain to me that the connotation of the word insinuates that women are somehow subservient or below men and that it's demeaning to use as reference to women. So hearing that, I did what I always do when presented with new info. And as it turns out, there are a lot of very compelling reasons that I had never considered why that word should not be used. That it reduces women to just the reproductive capabilities or that it potentially even dehumanizes them because the word females can be applied to things that are not even human. And oftentimes men who insist on using the word wouldn't use it to describe their own mother or grandmother. And I can see how that's true and it just gave me a lot to think about in terms of my own carefree use of the word and also just the power of our words in general. You see it wasn't the first time that I had used a word without fully understanding or witness somebody using a word that they didn't fully understand. You see, when my parents moved the entire family here from Taiwan, looking back now, I realized that they had to immerse themselves in a completely new culture, learn an entirely new language, and take on this immense challenge in order to give us new opportunities. I remember mom and dad always used to carry around this little brown dictionary, and in the margins, the pages of every document, every book, every newspaper, every flyer, they would always write notes about what words meant, always referring back to that Mandarin English dictionary when they didn't know something. And they would have to consult it often. I remember mom pulling it out when we'd have to take the bus to go somewhere. And thinking back, the fact that they were even able to do things like file their taxes, it just humbles me so much to think how much they went through in order to just begin to survive in this new place. I just can't even imagine how difficult it was for them to start. And there's evidence of that even in some of these oldest home video clips when I was looking through them. Take, for example, our very first Halloween when they took us out trick-or-treating. <laughs> Oh, look in here. Who have we got here? Can this be Frank and his little brother? Oh, here we go. What, what are you going as? Is he a, a warlock? What? what what's this? Are, are you uh, the witch's helper? Or? <laughs> you don't know? He hasn't decided yet. Okay. He have a broken arm. Oh, oh, you have a broken arm? I don't even see your arm. Oh, that's already... <laughs> <laughs> bye bye! You see, from even a friendly, simple interaction like that, that there was room for a confusion. But that didn't stop my parents from at least trying. And on top of that, they always made sure to share with us what they were learning as well and to teach us so that we would come up to speed faster. I remember we had this wall of spelling and vocab words that we'd add to periodically. And they would always have me practice pronunciation and spelling and the meaning of the words and quiz me every single day. Here. E L V O W L Milk. M I K E. But my parents' diligence in relaying what they were learning about the English language directly to me is really the reason why I would say I excelled at words and spelling in particular. I mean, fast forward to when I was in sixth grade, I won my school's spelling competition and ended up going on a small cable TV show where all the schools in the surrounding area sent a delegate for the televised spelling bee. Who are spelling all stars from each school? I'd like to introduce Frank Huang from Vessel School. Necessary. N-E-C-E-S-S-A-R-Y. Necessary. Tournament. T-O-U-R-N-A-M-E-N-T. -E Tournament. Our judge, is that correct? Our judge says that is correct. Congratulations. And we will I mean, to be honest, I was so low-key proud of my spelling skills. And again, none of this would have been possible if my parents hadn't nurtured that from an early age. But unfortunately, there were limitations. As much as my parents tried to teach me everything that they knew, because they didn't grow up here, there was a lot more that I had to learn on my own, in particular at school and at church. For the most part, most of it was pretty benign. Ah! And a lot of it was even learned by mistake. I remember a project in fourth grade where we had a report on recent news. So I went home and told my parents that I had a 
current event project. And that this current event project required us to go get a newspaper. Only to find out years later that they were actually asking us to report on current events. But not all the learning experiences were so benign. I remember specifically one time in third grade when it was raining. I had an umbrella and my friend Christina Chun asked if I could share that umbrella with her. For some reason, I specifically remember trying to be funny by responding with the phrase, not even a little bit. And I distinctly remember my brain short-circuiting and instead of saying bit, I changed the word to inch at the last moment. But because the word was already halfway out my mouth, I ended up conflating the two and I said not even a little binge. It was within earshot of teacher and I remember being super confused as to why she was getting so mad at me about never using that word ever again. I remember that was kind of my very first exposure to the category of bad words and because my parents were also trying to learn and it was probably a little bit awkward, I never made the point to ask them what words shouldn't be used. And so that's kind of where church came into play. Oftentimes at school I would learn these new words not knowing whether or not I should use them and then at church it kind of get broken down for me and come to think of it, I think my parents parents relied a lot on church friends for the same thing. I remember my friend Chris and his parents, because they were born and grew up here, a lot of what they said was good or bad went with my parents. I remember them telling us not to watch The Simpsons because it was bad. Hi Super Nintendo Chalmers! And also wasn't allowed to watch Michael Jackson because his dance moves were obscene. But beyond just being plain good or bad, they never really explained why it was that certain words were hurtful and shouldn't be used. And so it wasn't until about fifth grade when this new family moved in down the street and I quickly made a new best friend named Walter. We'd always get together to play and ride bikes and he was the very first person to ever defend me at school. When somebody tried to fight me, he was the only one to have ever defended me. But I remember one time going over to his house and his older brother was watching rap videos. It's the first time I had ever heard anyone rap an entire song. Song. It was Gangster's Paradise. And because I had somehow hurt him in passing, I thought it was okay to go ahead and greet him with, What's up, my N word? And remember, it was at that point that Walter actually took me aside outside and explained to me that that was actually not something that I should be saying. And it was the very first time that I could recall that somebody explained to me just how deep a connection and how deeply powerful certain words can be. I mean, thinking back, it was unfortunately a conversation that a black fifth grader could have and had to have. That there were certain experiences and certain lessons that he had at even such a young age that made it so that he was was able to understand that and had to share that with others to educate them. And although I listened to him and I never used that word again, it wasn't until I reached junior high that his words and his lessons actually came to a personal level for me. You see, it wasn't until I got into middle school that I began to understand what Walter was talking about. Between 6th and 7th grade, we moved and I changed school districts, so I went to a school where I knew nobody. And going to a largely non-Asian school, I quickly learned that the power of words, beyond just misspeaking or not understanding them, I learned that words have the power to label people often in derogatory and demeaning ways. And I learned very quickly firsthand how when used in certain ways, they could be destructive and used to tear people down. I remember there was a group of guys on campus that would always seem to target me. They would see me walking in the halls and walk into me on purpose. And then afterwards would start yelling words at me that at the time I didn't understand. Come to learn that a lot of these words were derogatory terms for Asians, which a lot of the terms didn't even apply to me because I wasn't even Korean or Japanese. But I remember feeling that raw hurt of being labeled and called something for just the way that I looked or my hair and I'm also not proud that I fell into that trap as well. In the process of learning how to defend myself, I learned how to fire right back at them. And you know, my parents didn't really have any solutions for me. I'm sure they faced some of those situations themselves, but honestly, they were probably just as confused as me to know what the meaning of those words is and exactly how to respond. These days, the power and meaning behind words and language has taken on a whole new meaning and dimension for me. As mom's dementia continues to worsen, the amount of words that she can speak and her ability to respond becomes less and less and fewer and fewer. Even a simple conversation like the one I showed you guys just a few short months ago are no longer possible. In the times that she can kind of respond, it becomes increasingly more often that she responds in Taiwanese and sometimes even just a little bit of Mandarin. No longer does she use English anymore. As I've Learned as this type of disease progresses, the person reverts more and more back to their mother tongue until eventually they lose the capability for speech altogether. And through this, it just reminds me how much effort it took them and how much work it took them to immerse themselves in a new culture and language and learn things that were new and uncomfortable, but be open to this learning process. <laughs> And these days I think that each of these moments could be the last time that I could be able to tell my mom that I love her and have her respond to me, understanding what I'm saying. It just absolutely drives home to me how important and how powerful words and language really are. From the destructive power of being able to tear somebody down completely, to the ability of being able to share with somebody close to you just how much you love them in their final moments. Words and language are such powerful tools that so many of us take for granted. And so what I've learned and what I hope 
hope you guys will take away from this too is that we absolutely must check the words that we use and to make sure that whatever we say can be for the benefit of others that those who hear can be built up.